Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the second of the fifth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, according to what some call the Zadok calendar or the Enochian calendar or the Dead Sea Scrolls calendar. However you want to coin it, it's the information found in what men have considered to be inspired that we're trying to follow to the best of our ability. It also corresponds with the 13th of July, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> and um, for anyone who might not know, just for references to put historical context to things, yesterday, the first of the fifth month, which is a Hodesh, but not one of the four remembrance days that are enumerated to keep, it was the day that Aharon, or Aaron, the brother of Moshe, the first Kohen under the Levitical kahuna in the wilderness there, it, it was the day that he was taken and he passed away, <clears throat> if you will. That's mentioned, I believe, in the book of Numbers around chapter 33. It might not be exactly 33, but it's around that area because I was reading that when it came up. Either way, we're going to take a little segue from what we've been doing and share a, a little bit of a treat here. I just recently came back from being able to see the Decalogue stone here from Las Lunas, New Mexico. That's me, just so you can get a comparison for how large it is, right? There's the stone proper. It, as you can see, the top part, it looks like it was scratched up. The, the first line was defaced there. And then over on the side, if you can see where the mouse pointer is on the right hand side, there's actually a chunk of rock that was missing. It's been missing since at least 1999. I'll show you the, the picture for that in just a moment. But here you can get an idea for the size. This is Yahi, or and he caught do not cause to be, right? And this is uh, low, what they say for never or don't. But either way, just so you can get a size or a, an idea for the size of some of the writing there. Okay, here's the Aleph Tau, which we'll cover more of that in just a moment. And then right here, you can see this is the, the, the uh, version of our creator's name, Yahuwah, Yod, He, Wahe. And it looks more uniform like this throughout generally it's not perfectly the same because it was scribed in stone and someone was doing it by hand but i i went over it very lightly and it came out like chalk over top of it and that was just traced you can see where it's not traced it's very hard to read the whole stone used to be maintained by boy scouts and it's not been done for i don't know how long sadly it's not taken care of so much anymore but right here you can see this is a computer graphics version done by Jürgen Neuhof um, in 1999. So very much appreciate this. And then you can see they have some information here. I'll go over that with you in just a moment. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out real quick is uh, the Paleo-Hebrew is very much like our English characters. You can see some of them more easily than others. You have the A here, here's an N, this is a K that's backwards. That would be the letter Yod. A little bit different from what we're familiar with, but it's like the hand and arm reaching down from above, which I thought was really interesting. Um, right here you have a Wa, and then the next character here, this is a Zaudi. It's not, it's not a character I'm familiar with in how it's normally written. There is no corresponding Greek letter that that could be equivalent to that I'm familiar with, that they might say that with. But that is a use of the Zaudi that I've never seen that is interesting. They, you can see the Tau here looks just like an uppercase T. And then <clears throat> one thing that I am familiar with, if you look right here where you have Elohim, the letter Mame is not how you would write it in the Paleo-Hebrew generally. 
the, the humps or the lines would be on the top there, not on the bottom. This is the Greek version of their character, the main. And you actually drop this line right here in the more modern way of writing it. But this is one of the characters they say is a Greek character and not a Hebrew one. They'll use that as a way of saying that this is not legitimate. But we're going to go over that in a little bit. So no worries. Um, I'm sorry if none of this makes sense to you. And Father willing, as time goes on, it will. But real quick, before we go over this, I wanted to show you something. Right here hopeofisrael.org, all right, and this is titled, Was There More Than One Exodus Out of Egypt? What we're about to share with you as quickly as possible is just some information, and we'll put all of the links for these things in the description for everyone to look at yourselves. There's a lot more. There's a lot more that you can dig into and to study than what we're going to be able to cover. So please, if you sincerely want to learn these things or look into it i highly recommend that but right here from the hope of israel.org this is a article about the fact that there was more than one exodus out of egypt okay it's by john d kaiser or kaiser and i'm not going to read the whole thing but i want to point out to you excuse me all right so we're not going to go over the whole thing but I wanted to show you, we believe, I believe I've read this before, right? This talks about the legends of the Grecian foundations of certain colonies and how they were done by Danius or Dardanus, Cadmus, uh, and other sons of Yahuda from the line of Zera with Hebrew immigrants. It, they were people that left before the exodus of Moshe. This is known from secular histories, and it's drawn together from places like Diodorus of Sicily. Diodorus Soclorus is another, if it's not the same individual, Herodotus, all right, and then quotes from other places like E. Raymond Capps, missing links discovered in the Assyrian tablets, and other things. I'll let you go over but this, well, okay, because it's it's important that you do so. But the point is it will show you that there were Hebrew immigrants or uh, Avrit, Avri, Avri. There were those who crossed over, if you will. They were known in secular history as the Hebaru. I believe they're called the, um, the Hebaru from Canaan. But that's not important at the moment. The fact is, they were sons of Abraham from the land of Egypt or Mitzrayim that left the area and founded different places along uh, what we call Turkey today and in Greece. And then they also, in the land of the, what the Levant or Canaan, the, the city states of Phoenicia, they took over Tyre and, and Sidon there. And they also spread, they went further west. Some of them went into the, the Middle East there, Colchis and other places. And these things are, are known in these histories. That's the point. It's not a history that we're, pre we're taught. We're, we're taught a lot of things that just aren't true. But if you read these things for yourself, it was known and pe men were aware of them and they wrote about it. So right here, you can read about this. And I also recommend Diodorus Seclorus for his histories on what... He compiled the histories of the and the ancients, what they believed about the creations of the world and the early history pre and post flood. Some of the things they mention that we don't really take into consideration is the conquests of Nimrod or his his family and what they did, like his son being Macedon, where he was planted up there and it was named after him. We have generally no idea about these things because we don't read where it's actually written. So I, I can't say I know all the nuances of all this history. I'm still studying myself, but I find it amazing that it's all congruent with what you can read straight out of the Bible and then what you can find in the other writings that are 
going with scripture found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls and witnessed by our forefathers who were of the belief, right? But point being, this is a witness right here. Was there more than one exodus out of Egypt? It quotes many sources, a variety of different things to show that there were there were indeed, and they, this hopeofisrael.org has a lot of articles, lots of different writings that show these things. Okay. <clears throat> But um, this is just one witness, okay? And it has a lot of quotes where you can look up. Oh, I'm, I keep saying, okay, I'm sorry about that. It has a lot of quotes and links for resources that you can also pick up. I highly encourage you, if you can get PDF versions to do so, if you're able to obtain hard copies to do so, and then not just have them on hand, but to read them, to become familiar with it. So it's ingrained in you, just like the scriptures. And then you can't be deceived when uh, they start talking about things that don't line up with it. So right here, I don't want to get too far into this one. You can see that. And again, there's many articles on this topic on here. I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that they write, because even in this part right here, a lot of times they'll quote Caldonia, or Macedonia as examples of where Dan has been. And I just mentioned Macedon was named after the son of Nimrod by and mentioned in these earlier histories. Caldonia, as we've mentioned before, and as you can see in just a moment, it was the name of a righteous remnant of believers who went with Danis or Dardanus founded the city of Troy, and then later that righteous remnant left before its fall and then went to first, I believe it was Crete, then from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul, and from Gaul to what we'd call Scotland. And the whole time they had a pious remnant that kept the laws of the altar that were migrating there. You can find that information right here in what's called the ancient or the history of ancient Caldonia from the time of Saint Chaldea or Kadoshi Chaldea the founder of Christianity they call it now you have to bear in mind that almost all the texts that we have all the truth that we have available was hidden in the fourth beast if you take in mind what's written in 2nd Baruch on the topic, it mentions directly, and the truth will be hidden in that beast for the time. Our Mashiach walked that out in his body as being presented to Rome by his own, mistreated, abused, made unrecognizable as a man, mocked, and, uh, and eventually killed in, in crucifixion there, and then buried for three days and three nights before resurrecting early dawn before the Shabbat, right? He walked out the truth of what would happen to his words as well. And the body of believers, because we're all one, this is part of the history of what we can read about with, with Fox's Book of the Martyrs and things of that nature. But Kadoshi Chaldean is the one that brought the good news, the Basora, he evangelized the, the coming of our Mashiach with bringing the Old and New Covenant to the Caldonians at that time. Before then, for over a thousand years, they were keeping what they called the laws of the altar, which if you read the book of Hanok or Enoch, first Enoch, if you read the testaments of the 12 patriarchs and the, the things that they would have known by the time that they were in Egypt, so that the testament of Louis, possibly the testament of Amram, right? The visions of Amram, sorry, and the writings of Noah, they would have known these things. They would have had all of that more fully, including the, the ones from Yaakov, where it mentions in the book of Yobelim that he was literally given all of history of what would happen to him and his descendants throughout time and told to write it down and to give it to his children. So they would have been cognizant of these things, and they had what they called the laws of the altar that they kept. And as they walked piously for over a thousand years, they were kept from they were kept from any problems. But as they turned from the truth given to them, 
they had problems and they were introduced to our Mashiach through Rome, just like most of us. But the point is, this history, just like all of the scriptures, was hidden for a time. When this was found, it was translated by a Roman Catholic priest. It's right there in the preface. So you might read things here that don't necessarily line up with actual history perfectly. But there's a lot of gold. And there's so much in here that's corresponding to other things that you can find evidence that we're going to look at that it's very worthwhile to to look at this and to carefully compare this with actual history to see what has been messed with and what hasn't so this is a wonderful history regardless of a righteous remnant from the times pre moshe they would have left if you look at what it mentions in that article we were just looking at Dardanus and those founded the city-state of Troy about 34 years before the Exodus, it mentions. Right? I'll have to find that, or you can look here and find out the specific thing, but that quote is from somebody else. It is contemporary, or it is congruent, however, with what you can read in the history itself, that before the um, Pharaoh had killed the firstborn males, the righteous remnant left they were protected and then they founded the city of troy this will take their history from that time roughly 1500 bc all the way through to 1290 a.d and the death of the maiden of norway the last heir for succession that they had that was general and then they had the secession wars where edward the longshanks came in and tried to take over the fightings and things happened amongst them with William uh, William Wallace, who was foretold in this book. And then what happened afterward with Robert the Bruce and the others, the permanent Catholics that appealed to the Little Horn to allow them to have a sovereign separate nation from Br Britain or England while paying fealty to him. And the Caledonians, the true believers, were ousted at that time. <clears throat> so... That's what this history covers, and it's very worthwhile to read it. It's pretty amazing, but we're not going to get into the too much of that either. I just want to point out this is another witness for that. Can To prove these things, a, an outside witness for all of that that you can see, and these are... Um, these are the references or the illusions of how the languages are related. So if you please will allow me. This is... A, a website were the ancient ancient British tongues related to Hebrew. There might be more articles that cover topics like this. I don't know every one of them. I found this one to be um, pretty succinct. It, it simplifies and speaks very clearly on the topic. So if you will, we'll read through this real quick, and then I'll show you the other evidences that corroborate these facts. We've already covered them before a little bit. But I think this is worthwhile. It says, at present, Welsh is only spoken in Wales. And that's at present for when this was originally written. Okay. And Brenton in Brittany, yet there was a time when it was spoken not only over the British Isles, but over parts of continental Europe. For it has been maintained falsely in my view that the Celts or ancient Gauls were one and the same with the Britons, and making allowance for dialect, use the same language. Although most modern researchers deny this, the widespread knowledge of early Welsh must, must hold true. And we've covered it a little bit before, but just for the record here, there's multiple waves of the Hebrews through history migrating different areas. The ones that we're focused on right now are the migrations that went north and west. You have the original times where we're talking about the founding of Troy, the times where the Hebrews were leaving Egypt to found different city-states. It was around 1500 BC, uh, around that, not perfectly, okay? And from there, they've been spreading out. So you've had almost 500 years of time from when they first were leaving Egypt 
to the times and reign of Dawid and Shalomo, or David and Solomon. 500 years for migrating, spreading out, and growing. Predominantly paganized. If you take modern history, our, our lives as an example, those of us who profess belief to those of us who are trying to live it, and I'm not trying to be rude to anybody, but I'm for our, our mind's sake, if you take into the facts of what is, if you look at what you consider back then, you can read right from what we call the Bible. There's a multitude of those that were of Israel, of Israel, that were not steadfast to the truth, right? The same was true back then. And a lot of them you can read in that ancient history of Caldonia, a lot of them adopted the ways of the, the Gentiles around them and turned from the, the truth given, and so became one people with them everywhere that they would spread. <clears throat> um, that happened in different waves. So you have different dialects of Celtic, for example, and that would have been the different waves generally of the migrations of the way they came over. The Welsh has some influence with Assyrian, there was other parts that had different influences in other ways. And if you take the time to study it, men more learned than I am would be more familiar with it. And then you have the writings of the people that did study those things that go over it where you can see these examples for yourself. But the best thing to do is to actually study it for yourself, take the time to look, it, and then you learn, right? But this is at present, I already read that part, sorry. It says, very many of the Celtic or Gaelic, Gallic, right, words agree very well with the Welsh, both in sound and in sense. In addition, many of the names of cities, mountains, rivers, etc. in France, anciently Gaul, cannot be accounted for without a knowledge of Welsh. Here are a few examples. Arles, uh, it's Latin. Our Latin derived from R upon and la laith moist, so upon the moist, right? Because situated upon moist ground, right? Use ludun. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing these right, right? It's derived from uchel, right? The high and din fortified mound, right? And here's another one that's from back or ridge. I can't pronounce these very well, so I'm just I'm gonna skip over that, right? The river RR RR, sorry, in France. All right. Arf, Araf is slow or soft in the Gaelic. In just a moment, you'll see it's not just Thomas Richards Welsh in English dictionary, but that's one example and where these come from. We're gonna get another example or a book that makes it even more clear. Uh, the connection between them and gives you many, many examples. <clears throat> this is, was English related to Hebrew? The idiomatic likenesses between English and Hebrew were noticed by Tyndale when he translated the scriptures. He said the properties of the Hebrew tongue agreeeth a thousand times more with the English than with the Latin. The manner of speaking is in both one, so that in a thousand places there needs not but to translate the Hebrew word for word. And this would have been Tyndale speaking of the English language in the 1300s, where I believe he's also quoted as saying, yeah, there's some 5,000 roots directly related to it, right? And even today, there's a gentleman, I believe our brother Earl's talked about him too, Isaac Mosenson, who's a Yahudi or a Jew, if you will, and he wrote a book called Origin of Speeches, and he also has the word dictionary in not only English, but also Japanese and a variety of different languages, where he traces the words in those languages back to the Hebrew, or what he calls the Edenic root. I don't agree with his premise, but when you look at what scripture says... <laughs> It proves the things that are true and the fact that you can trace the, the Japanese, the Indians, and all these different languages to Hebrew-speaking peoples in their histories. Um, 
it gives it legitimacy. So I highly recommend looking at those books. Just you have to be mindful that the commentary is not always what I would consider accurate. It says Canon Samuel Lainson found 5,000 roots in the English language. Our British ancestors, and we've read that. I think that we have one video where we've gone over some of those before from that book, right? Other authorities put the figure still higher. The Welsh is so much like the Hebrew that the same syntax may be used for both. Our Welsh translation of the set-apart scripture seems to have one peculiar advantage of most modern versions, in that the Hebrew idioms, phraseology, or forms of speaking are retained, and that with great propriety too, in the Welsh language. Thomas Richards, Welsh and English Dictionary, 1839. And I believe it was not only the Welsh, but also the Irish is almost word for word translated. The only difference is the sounds, but the way the syntax structure and everything functions is identical. In contrast, the Germanic languages or the other versions of the Hebrew that changed over time lost that sentence structure, but kept a lot of the way the words sounded or the direct word-for-word -word meanings of it in its usage, which we'll get to in just a, a little bit here. It says, the Old Saxon language is said to be 80% Hebrew. The ancient poem in the Irish language known as the Book of the Dun Cow, 1106 A.D., are, quote, not unlike the poetical passages in the Old Testament, unquote. And that's from the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, Early Irish Myths and Sagas. Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah 28, 11 says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And that's speaking to Ephraim there, right? The Hebrew word for stammering here is le'eg. Right, reading right to left, but English reads left to right, so it would be pronounced Gael in English. Gaelic is not only a foundation of the English language, including a lot of our principles of common law, but it is still spoken. And remember, we've gone over that for anyone who might not be familiar, the common law as codified by Alfred the Great in his dooms or judgments is what we'd call the Ten Commandments and the right rulings from Exodus chapters 21 through 23, the book of the Epistle of Yaakov, some sections from the book of Acts, and other legal jurisprudence from what we'd call the Bible, and then other jurisprudence from what came up in the course of time for the common law of England. But that is the foundation of the laws of our, our country and England and Australia. Every common law country is supposed to be under the Bible as it's instituted judgment for what is law. <clears throat> but anyways, the, uh, the roots for the words and things, a lot of that came from the Gaelic and not the English language because it was already prevalent there and it was adopted by him. Alfred the Great didn't make up his own system, but he inherited what was passed down all the way from Molmontis, the Celtic king from 500 BC, around that era. He was the first known to actually have recorded as the common law of England the statutes of what we can read in Exodus, verbatim. And that was within 200 years after the fall of and the captivity of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians where some of them migrated to the west there, Ephraim in particular, inhabiting what we call Britain. It says, but it's not only the foundation of the English language, but is still spoken in its primitive simplicity in many places in Scotland and the north of Ireland. Judges, or Shephotim 12.6 says, the Ephraimites, Right, the F Ephraimites, right, had trouble pronouncing the aspirate H, as in Shibboleth. In Britain today, the linguistic trait remains, especially with Cockney. Speaking, and 
there was actually a movie, an older movie from the 1920s, I believe. I might be off on that. But they made a peculiar um, nuance of pointing out a little girl who could not pronounce the S-H properly as we comprehend it in American English. I can't remember the movie or the quote or anything, but I do remember that coming up in a conversation about this particular phenomenon. But it says, speaking of the Kumrick use of the Hebrew rule of aspiration, Dr. Mayer says, the assuming of the guttural aspiration on the part of the consonant under the influence of the preceding vowel is the kind of change regularly adopted in Irish. Whereas in Welsh, the vocalization of the mute is now the general rule. And this is just talking about how the language changed for different groups in different ways over time. Just like all of us are speaking a living language and it changes and, and adapts in usage over time, colloquially in, in the pockets of wherever you're at, right? It says, it is now unquestionable, however, from the gradual and even now only practical adoption of this rule in Welsh, that the Irish usage is the more ancient of the two, as it is still further pr proved by its striking analogy with that of the Dagesh Lene in Hebrew. The Dagesh Lene, as opposed to the Dagesh Forte, are the two dots that they use with the vowel pointing for... Uh, the purposes of the Hebrew. The dagesh forte or the fortifying dagesh is the hardening one. And I believe it's used with um, the begad kafath to make them one form, B, for example, or the softer V, V. And that's whether or not the dots in the bosom of those five letters. The dagesh lene is the doubling dagesh, if you will. You can correct me if I'm wrong but it's the one that we would use for uh, the different words in English that we have a double letter in the middle. Whenever you would add a, pref a prefix letter, like a mem, to a word in Hebrew, quite often that next word or that next letter would be doubled. So it would close the consonant of that first one and it would start the next. The Messiah, for example, in Hebrew is Ham Mashiach. Right, Hamashiach, you just say it all is one, but you would double the hey there. <clears throat> they do that with a lot of words. In English there, you see like sibboleth, little, middle, swimming, puddle, running. We, we do it all the time as a natural phenomenon in English. We just don't have a, a rule or a, a necessity. It's a, it's a carryover from the Hebrew. <clears throat> If you ever look into the 1886 Webster's Dictionary and you read through the history of the English language, you can see the effects of the, the changing of the language over time. And if you keep in mind where it came from here, it's an amazing thing to look at. Webster himself acknowledged that there was people who connected the Hebrew and English, but he did not promote just willy-nilly doing that himself. And you can read what he had in his own words in that text there. But to continue here, it says, Davidson's Hebrew grammar says, the word dagesh is from a root which possibly expressed the idea of hardness. The sign of dagesh is a point in the bosom of a letter. And this point was used to indicate both a lighter and a heavier kind of hardness. When it indicates a lighter hardness, it is called dagesh lene. When the stronger, it is called dagesh forte. And this is in regard to the vowel pointing in what they call the Masoretic text. It's the Hebrew that we have available from the Stones to Knock and from the Westminster's Codex and mostly everything outside of what is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's different varieties of them, the history of how they got the vowel points and which ones they decided to use because there are a few different uh, types of pointing that they have. There, It wasn't all uniform all at once is my point. If you want to get into more information on that, you can look at Dr. Bill Barrick's Hebrew Grammar, the 503 from the Master Seminary that's free online. 
He doesn't go into great detail, but he covers generally the history behind that, a little bit of how they have the influences of Aramaic originally, and then that kind of filtered out to the pure Hebrew, and then it went on to change, which agrees completely with what you can read from the book of Yobelim, where Abram and everyone had the Hebrew or the Yahudith language taken from them at the Tower of Babel, but when our forefather repented and he prayed to be delivered from evil spirits, evil ruachot, he was given the language of creation and he was given the writings of his forefathers and he was told to transcribe them and then he studied them. And that was how he was to be delivered from evil spirits through knowledge of the truth by given, by the word. Something And by going back to the original language of creation here, right? But back on point, it says, you can take any sentence in Hebrew and change it into Gaelic word for word without altering the order of a single word or letter. And you will have the correct Gaelic idiom in every case. That's what I meant. The only thing that changed really was the sounds. The sounds of the words and how they were pronounced changed. It it's gone over a little bit in the books that we're going to look at here, but you'll have to look at them yourself to know for sure how it changed and why is covered in a little bit of detail there or more than I can cover now. But I, I highly encourage you, especially people who know Gaelic, if you're familiar with that language, if you're familiar with Greek, especially the ancient Greek, or if you're familiar with Latin, this is very useful because this stuff can be proven. You can test it for yourself and you'll know more, more surely than someone who doesn't speak those languages. He says, you cannot do that with any other language in Europe. Hebrew has a rule. Hebrew has a rule which is known as aspiration, which applies to certain consonants when they follow a vowel. It means the same consonant has two different sounds according to its position. And those are the Begad Kephath letters, if I'm, if I'm uh, on the right track there. There's only five of them that do that. And Begad Kephath is an acronym for Bet, Gimel, Dalit, Pei, Kaf, and Tau. This is Gaelic has the same rule and applies it in exactly the same way. Even words borrowed from other languages are at once modified in sound according to the Hebrew rule of aspiration. Does any other language use this rule? I don't know of any. Ancient Medea, or Medai, where the ten tribes were taken captive, is where the language of Sanskrit was developed. Sanskrit has a more elaborate rule for modifying the consonants called Sandhi under which every consonant may have as many as four distinct sounds according to its position. Dr. James Pritchard, in his book The Eastern Origin of the Celtic Nations, has shown that the Welsh alone of all living languages has preserved the rule of Sandy entire. And the Welsh are even to this day known as the Cymri, and the Cymri is or the house of Omri was known as Bet Qumri by the Babylonians and the Assyrians from the time of Omri all the way through and past the captivity. This is proven with the Bet, um, the inscription from Darius the Great, the Beth Husin stone. I'm not saying that correctly, but where he records his victories and conquests in the Assyrian, Babylonian, and um, Persian languages, if I remember. It's like the Rosetta Stone of the East, they call it. But in that is where you find the Sakai, the sons of the Saxons, the sons of Yitzhak, are the Scyth Scythians, who are called Bet Qumri. They're all synonymous for the same people. And those Qumri are the Sumerians of antiquity that spread throughout Europe and went over into the British Isles. They went north and became intermixed with the Germanic people, and then they went back into Turkey, into Galatia. And this is known history, but it's not prevalently taught to us today. However, you can see the Welsh alone 
retain the influences of, of the Sanskrit sentence structure because they're the ones that took it out and then brought it of the Celtic speaking slash Hebrews, right? <clears throat> As opposed to the Irish, which never had that. The Irish left beforehand of the tribes of Dan. If you remember, or if you're not familiar, during the times of Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges, in the victory that they had against their enemies, Deborah singing, she mentions that Dan's off in his ships. It mentions, I believe, in Yeshiyahu, or, or it could be in a different place, that Dan and Yahwin were off doing mercantile work together, or the Greeks, if you will, were Danai, and the, the, the native children of Yahwin that intermixed and became one people. So it's collaborating witnesses to that, but they never had the influences of the Sandi, and you can see that their language does not do that. The Bet Kumri, the house of Omri, of the sons of Ephraim, the royal clan, if you will, that were taken into captivity, they generally did have that influence and they brought it with them, but they were they left beforehand. They didn't stay in that area long enough to lose the language the way that the others did that we'll read about in just a minute. So, and that we've also already covered before. But oh, I'm sorry about that. It says, I don't want to reread what we ever did. That. It says, the Welsh alone of all living languages kept the rule of Sandy entire. There you go. He proves from this and many other similarities, including words in such common use as the whole paradigm of the verb to be, that the ancestors of the Welsh must have lived among the people who spoke Sanskrit. These people were in Madai. He also shows that Gothic is the link between ancient Sanskrit and modern Teutonic. And the Gothic languages are what all the Germanic came from, the Germanic being what we're going to cover here in just a moment, but it was the influences of the Sanskrit on the Hebrew for a longer period that caused the Gothic. And if you recall... We mentioned that the Eastern migrations here, the ones that stayed in captivity in the Middle East there, they lost the usage of the syntax structure of the Hebrew, but they retained the, the wording better than the Celtic version. And they went through two different sound shifts. One of them, uh, here, let me finish this real quick, and then we'll cover that because we've read it a little bit. We've talked about it before, but then we'll we'll go into that that relation there okay it says the grammatical structure of welsh and hebrew is the same the verb for instance occupies the same place in the sentence of both languages the roots of most welsh words may be traced to hebrew not only do welsh words themselves indicate a similarity their variations and inflections afford a much stronger proof of affinity which the other books that I'm going to show you go over in more detail. It doesn't just mention it like this, but it shows you the examples, I believe, in some of them. Okay, and this is the um, the Hebrew has verb tenses. There's five different verb tenses that changes the vowel sounds for each word and how they're used. I'm not as familiar with this as I would like to be. I'm still learning. Okay, so anyone that might know better, please correct me if I'm wrong. But in the way that it changes for the verb tense, it changed the the pronunciation of the vowel sounds. It's very fluid in that way. When they went into the East there, when they were taken into captivity, they lost that usage and it was locked into one sound pattern for all of these words. And it's what Terry Bloodgett calls the first sound shift amongst the Germanic speaking peoples that happened around, uh, what did they say, 500 BC? And the one around 500 AD was the second one. But the, the second Germanic sound shift was only local to uh, Europe and just a, a part of that. It became known as the High German sound shift. And it's what High German speaking today is so different. 
But if you compare Yiddish and the High German, it's an identical, just the Yiddish used the Hebrew characters and the High German uses the rune font, Latin adopted letters that they'd had. Otherwise, it's almost the identical language because it's the same when the Yahudim were taken out of the land by Hadrian in 130 and they spread out and they were migrating different places when they, the ones that came back from Babylon and that were there with our Mashiach and then were taken out and spread, they brought with them the Chaldean influences of how the language was spoken. They'd say B'nai Brass or B'nai, instead of B'nai Brit, for example, with the S's instead of T's. And they had other phenomenon of that that they carried with them. And that caused the sound shifts for what we call High German. That is the second one um, that they cover. And we'll go ahead and show you now, just for the record, that is found, sorry about that. That is found in... Here we go. Here we go. Sorry about that. That is found in the phonological similarities in Germanic and Hebrew by Terry Bloodgit. Terry Marvin Bloodgit. This is what he wrote for his doctrinal dissertation in 1981. And then it was approved, and he got his doctorate in 1982 for a doctor in philosophy in German, in the Germanic language. So I highly recommend reading this. He goes into a lot more detail, although he doesn't directly say that the Germanic is from the Hebrew. He makes the compelling evidence for that, and he encouraged further study at that time, which I don't know if it was ever done. But... This is another one of the evidences we'll have a link for that anyone can look at. And as you can see, it was approved. It was read. They found that it was acceptable as a scholarly doctrinal document where he makes these claims. It's pretty amazing. So the things that I'm just mentioning about the Germanic sound shifts, the Begad Kafath letters and the phenomenon of how they work in relation to each other in Germanic and Hebrew specifically is covered in this document. The other ones I'm reading or I'm talking about, we'll, we'll get to in just a second, but they're all right here in these books that were written a few hundred years ago. However, it says, back on track here, it says, in the Kumrik, as well as the Hebrew, the cases and gender of nouns are distinguished by affixes and prefixes. The plural number of nouns likewise is often formed in a similar manner in the Kumric by adding in to the singular. Welsh, like Hebrew, has no present tense. In the formation of sentences and in the government of words, in the agreement of the adjective adjective with the subject sorry substantive in the precedence of the latter in the usual exceptions to this rule and in verbs plural being governed by nominatives singular i'm so sorry if you're not familiar with all these things because we haven't been doing english grammar since you were in school these are just phenomenon of how the the, the language structures work for both languages how all of them tie together and they they function in the similar manner so it you'd have to read about these things to get familiar with them again i'm sorry about that this is what deters a lot of people because we we don't take the time to know these things so well there's no reason for it in your general life and so instead of educating ourselves and becoming familiar and actually knowing it we just take what other people say for granted But a refresher on how English works would help anyone with how these things are supposed to function. The whole purpose is they agree with the Kumric or Welsh rendering of how the, the words and sentences go together and how the Hebrew, it does it in the same manner. 
So it's in the verbs plural being governed by nominative singular, the Welsh so exactly corresponds with the Hebrew that the same syntax might serve for both. Merrick Kazabone, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, has taken some pains to show that the Saxon language has great affinity with the Greek. And this is another thing which um, they call Indo-European languages. You'll find that a lot of this stuff is acknowledged by modern scholarship in what they call Indo-European languages, how it's created or it's connected with some Iranian or Sanskrit and even some stuff in India and how it's connected with the Greek, the Latin and Germanic languages in some fashion. So these things are acknowledged by that capacity, but the connection being Hebrew is never talked about. That element is what is perverted or hidden, and it's done intentionally. Because if we know who we are and where we came from, we take his word a little more seriously. This is all our modern unabridged dictionaries are inadequate with regard to the origin or etymology of old English words not derived from Greek or Latin. And Terry Bloodgett mentions there's a holy two-thirds of the Germanic languages that are of unknown origin, and he traces all of those words back to Hebrew. <clears throat> all of them in his dissertation. There's a lot more work that could be done to prove that out, and gentlemen like Isaac Moseson have done that in the Word Dictionary. It's an amazing reference. I think there's over 20,000 English words he traces back to Hebrew. The reason why that's possible, because there's not even 20,000 words in the original scriptural Hebrew language, period. But in English, we take a word like yobel, where we get the word jubilee, and then we have a whole bunch of derivatives from it, jubilant, jubilation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can take that one word and have a divergence of many, and that's why there's so many that we can trace back. But point being... There's other men that have given lots of information that corroborate this stuff, but the the tie-in, excuse me, the tie-in of the history of our people and the migrations and how it changed, that is all muddied up. So Father Willing will see that there is a connection here, and the whole point will tie us back to the Decalogue stone in just a moment, right? It says, very much of the Greek and Latin and other European languages can be derived from Hebrew. So the question becomes, did even those English words that are similar to Greek and Latin come from them or their predecessor Hebrew? These European languages are quite young compared with the old Hebrew. And this is pages 67 to 72 of El's Covenant Man, British Israel by Edward Odlum. And he gives many English roots from the Hebrew. This is the language of the learned bards in which their poetry was composed was Hebrew. Taliesin, a celebrated bard of the ancient Britons, who was subsequently converted to Christianity, distinctly says when speaking of his own songs, My lore has been declared in Hebrew. In the Hebraic tongue I have sung. And Taliesin, um, I don't believe that's the one they called Merlin, but it might be one of the ones that they called Merlin. Uh, there is also another one. And if you all remember, we have the British bard slash prophet that was attributed to foretelling the founding of America that we read uh, the writings of as well for another example of that kind of phenomenon. And a third witness to the legitimacy of the bards and holding the history and its connection to Hebrew you can read in Te Taffy, the Irish bard songs that were compiled about the migration of Taffy, the daughter of Zadik Yahu, and how she was taken by Yeremi Yahu from Egypt to Ireland to marry the Hermon there, or the son of Yahuda from the line of Zerah, that was the largest landholder in Northern Ireland, and their children were the first kings and the monarchs of the Ulster plantation there, or the Ulster kingdom. But 
the whole writing, the Tay Taffy writing, even in the English, it's very sing song. It's an, it's an amazing thing. The om almost the entire thing rhymes, and it's a narrative flowing story. It has foretellings in it. It is pretty awesome. We've covered a little bit of it here as well. If you all remember, there is a witness to the legitimacy of Ron White's discovery of the Ark of the Covenant in what he called Jeremiah's Garodo under Golgotha, north of the, of the city there, where he had mentioned these things. He never once quoted or mentioned the book of Taffy. But if you read right there in chapter one, when she was taken, she was hidden right in the cave where that was, and the fear of it was upon her. That very fear that she describes was also witnessed and talked about by Ron Wyatt in the little boy that he sent into that cave first that came running out that said, what is in there? What is in there? And he wanted nothing to do with the place after that. A supernatural fear, if you will, that overpowered him. That same thing that she talks about there, and the two are completely unrelated, but it's a great witness to these things. However, the whole book is in a rhyming tone. It's an amazing thing, and it, uh, it's another witness, like I said, to the legitimacy of what you can see here. This is Th Dr. Thomas Stratton of Inborough, who we're about to look at in just a minute, said, It would be difficult to adduce a single article or form of construction in the Hebrew grammar, but the same is to be found in Welsh. And there were many whole sentences in both languages exactly the same in the very words. So that gentleman right there, we're about to cover here. He's the cooperating witnesses that ties in all of these things, okay? When you look at the ancient history of Caledonia, to prove that, you also have the writings of this gentleman or another witness for them is right here. If I can get it to pop up, sorry about that. Thomas Stratton, he, oh, there we go. This is one of them. It's the Celtic origin of Greek and Latin. And specifically, let me get the first one up. No, it's not going to do that. Just a moment. I'm sorry. There we go. So this one right here is the first book of his that he wrote. And this is the affinity between the Hebrew language and Celtic, being a comparison between Hebrew and the Gaelic language or the Celtic of Scotland. That's the particular one. The same Celtic that's spoken by the Caledonians in particular. All right. And its affinity to the Hebrew. This entire book that he wrote covers that very topic. Sorry about that. It's about 84 pages. I don't want to get into all the detail there. I highly recommend that you do it. He wrote more later. All of these books were written by him, but he goes into the evidence behind it, and he gives you many, many examples why the language changed, how it changed, and the words that connect one from the other just for the Gaelic and the Hebrew, and specifically the Gaelic that's spoken in Scotland or by the Caledonians. You have different versions even amongst the Scottish, high and low Scottish. You have the Caledonian Scottish, and then you have the influences of the Scots that came in from Ireland, and the Lowland Scot language, <clears throat> or the Gaelic language, I'm sorry. But again, the influences and the reasons for how it changed can be studied. It's in the ancient history. It's in other histories that we know of. And then you can see the phenomenon in how the language itself is spoken. That's my whole point. I'm, I'm not a studied man. I'm not a scholar. I don't know those things like someone who is more versed would. But our Father has been pleased to show me these things and allowed me to read these books. And um, I just share what he has given here with everybody. I think anyone who's more versed at that would be better off at sharing it too. Um, aside from this one, the next connection there is the ancient 
origin of the Celtic origin of Greek and Latin. And this is where it ties them together. Because as you can read in the ancient history of Caledonia with the migration of those Hebrews and where they went, you can see the effect in the languages. The ancient he Greek, it says, was formed within two generations after the flood. Nimrod was prevalent and reigning around the third generation, or, right? He was the, th the third generation from the flood, and he was dominating the world by the 17th generation, it says in the, in the book of uh, the recognitions of Clement there. And if you follow the timelines generally with what's in Yobelim for what was happening, you can see more information in regard to these in the secular histories with Diodorus Seclorus, for example, in what Nimrod was doing to subdue different parts of the world. You can see more about these histories in the etymology of the words and the, the, the mystery religions that were brought up in Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons, but they all tie together to show the same picture. That, that's my point. Here, this book covers how that same Hebrew that became the Celtic spoken in Scotland was the origin of ancient Greek or influenced it and Latin. Just like it says Cadmus brought the letters of Phoenician or Hebrew to the Greeks, and then those same characters were adopted and became the Roman letters that we, we all use today but it was originally Hebrew, right? We know these things, but this is the actual evidence for it. This is the connection for Indo-European languages being Hebrew. This is not taught, as far as I know, anywhere today. But I'll share this book with you. It covers that, and he had more. This is one where it's connecting them together. There's other writings that have them separate. I have a few of the different PDFs, and I'll share what I can in the description for everyone, all right? Aside from this and the other one proving these, you have a further cooperating witness completely separate from all of that. And that's right here in the history of the ancient kings of Britain. This was originally written in Welsh, or in the Welsh language, and uh, translated into English when it was... Uh, discovered that way. You can read about the history of it in the beginning of the book as well. But the point for our purposes, the point here is only uh, the information right in the beginning, which I will cover with you just real quick. You can see here, it covers the kings from Brutus all the way to Codwaller, excuse me, Codwaller, right? who was, um, if I remember, and I might have this wrong, I'm sorry, but he was the grandfather of Card Caradoc, or maybe the great-grandfather of Caradoc. Brand, the, the blessed, was a druid that was Caradoc's father, and he became converted to the belief very early. Caradoc himself was the pen dragon, or the king of kings amongst the British that was the the head um, general fighting against the Romans that were trying to occupy them or take over at the time. He was betrayed and captured, and he was in Rome for a while as a prisoner, along with his son or daughter, his daughter Gladius, who they named Claudia, and married uh, Putin's there, and then his son or her son, depending on who you, you listen to there, Linus, and it was Linus who was the first overseer of the Roman assembly from the British palace there in Rome. Just for a connection on all these things, he was the one that was anointed by Shaul, as mentioned in the Apostolic Constitutions. <clears throat> and they're from the sons of Zerah, as we're about to see here. So this is the other witness that corroborates these things real quick. So I'd like to share that with you. As far as I'm aware, they were not, no one that wrote the ancient history was aware of this or was aware of the affinity of the languages and cooperated together. This is These are different writings that came down in different ways that all happen to have cooperating information, which helps to you know prove its truth, at least to my mind. 
it's not a concerted effort by people. Although he could have done it that way, as the scripture says, yet he does not need man to witness of him, right? He knows the minds of all men, and he himself will make himself available to those who are worthy, as you can see plainly in his walk in ministry. This is the Chronicles of the Kings of Britain, Book the First, History of Brutus. After the destruction of Troy, Aeneas Whiteshield and his son Ascanius, whose mother was Crucia, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering these, right? Crisa, the daughter of Pyram, king of the Trojans, right? The daughter of Pyram, who was the last king at the fall of Troy, as related in the Iliad and the Odyssey the secular Greek histories that cover this topic, although they're more written like sagas or stories, they generally are supposed to be about these events. When you compare what's in that to the version in the ancient history of Caledonia, it's a little bit of a discrepancy. But I'll let you, you know, be the judge of that for yourselves. It says, The daughter of Hiram, the king of the Trojans, fled by sea to Italy, with a fleet of eight and twenty ships accompanied by people of either sex and all ages to the number of 88,000. This is 88,000 Trojans that escaped the fall of Troy that were not part of the righteous remnant who was about a hundred people, just for a contrast there. So these are 88,000 paganized Hebrews keeping the mystery religion, Babylonian garbage of some type, right? They mixture contrary to the laws of the altar that caused them to be subjected to problems. That was why Troy fell, as you can read in the history there. And if you remember, the scripture says that a city founded in blood won't have a, a good end. You can see the a brother against brother and all these things that are talked about in the very founding of the beginnings of Rome and the mixing of these people. You can see why as it was foretold in the book of Tetaphi, our Mashiach chose to go through the Romans to have them appointed to be a watch in the night, right? <clears throat> and then it was elucidated even more clearly by the four beast empires, and then what that fourth beast is and all that is in Scripture. It's just not in what we'd call the Bible. Back on track here. It says, Latinus, who was at that time king, having decried the strangers, or described the strangers, dispatched a messenger to ascertain who and what they were. Latinus, being satisfied with the reply, at once consented that they might land and purchase necessaries conditionally, that no ill usage should be offered to the inhabitants. Latinus then invited Aeneas, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, and a few of his friends to an entertainment at his castle, and it was here that Aeneas saw Lavinia, the daughter of Latinus, whose beauty was allowed to be unrivaled, and which so captivated Aeneas that he solicited from her father the honor of making her his wife in dower. Upon Aeneas being informed that Lavinia was the betrothed of Toronus, king of the Rut. Tullians, he requested that Latinus would permit the affair to be settled between Turnius and himself, to which Latinus, who was favorably disposed towards Aeneas, willingly consented. So he coveted another man's wife, is what happened. Turnus, hearing what had passed, at once commenced hostilities between or against Latinus, who soon found a ready auxiliary in Aeneas. When the two armies were in sight of each other, Turnus sent a challenge to Aeneas to decide the contest in single combat, as they alone were immediately concerned, and Lavinia espoused the conqueror. Aeneas accepted the challenge with great joy, and they fought till their spears were shivered or shriveled to atoms, their swords broken at the hilts, and it then became a contest of body to body. But as Elohim is the arbiter of events, there is no victory without his will. There is no deliverance in anyone else, right? He is the deliverer of all men, especially of those who believe. 
right? The outcome of every successful issue is by his purview and providence. That's the kind of hum humility that we have to have if we want to be true to the word. <clears throat> Says Aeneas slew Turnus, received the pledges of allegiance from the army of Turnus, seized himself of his estates, and married Lavinia. For five years, Latinus and Aeneas reigned co-jointly. When the former dying, Aeneas succeeded to the whole sovereignty, a son of Yahuda being over the reign as foretold. Right, you can find this information in the common scriptures. The Baraka of kingship promised to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and then given to Yahuda in the course of time. You can see it even more clearly when you look at the writings that are not in what we call the Bible, the Book of Yobelim, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and the like make it very explicit that the kahuna, or the priesthood, if you will, was given to Louis, and the kingdom was given to Yahuda, and through those two, our Mashiach was to come, but predominantly of the tribe and line of Yahuda as the coming king. And it's even... It's even foretold in their births, if you realize what day, like Yahuda was born, on the very same day as Yitzhak, who was the promised seed, born on the third, on the 15th of the third month, right? The same time every covenant was made. When the word was birthed into the world, if you will. But back on point here, it says, Aeneas succeeded to the whole sovereignty, built a city, which he called Lavinium, and reigning but four years after Latinus died, was succeeded by his son, Selvius, and that means wild, right? I don't want to get too far into this one, but you can read here what happens yourselves, all right? They go on to uh, have a few generations here, or a couple generations, and then it is the time of Brutus, and how he unintentionally caused the death of his father, which was foretold. And he was forced to leave the area where he goes and then petitions and has his uh, Greek slaves freed. And then he takes these Trojan slaves that he helped liberate. He goes over to found New Troy in what we call the area of London today. So this is a witness a, a, another witness to the Hebrews being in England. This is the southern part of Britain, the Caledonians in the far northern part of Britain. And I want you to really pay attention. If you take the time to look into the history of these people, how they live their lives and what they suffered for their choices, as opposed to the Caledonians that you can read in the ancient history, you can see the contrast be between those who were studiously guarding his word as opposed to those who were not, and how they were all kept, and, and they all got the, what they deserved according to how they handled the truth given to them. It's important for us to keep these things in mind because the truth affects us in the same way, right? But right here, um, it goes on the first few chapters. You can read it. It goes into great detail about his liberation of those people and the founding of Troy from there, or New Troy, which became Lewd later on, which we call London. And for a, another witness to the authenticity of this, and maybe for something that you might not know, the book of Acts, the last chapter 29, talks about when Shaul came to Britain, he stayed with Hebrews and he announced these things in Lewd. So there's that to consider as well. Now, with all that being shared, I wanted to go back over this really quick if we've got some time. Yeah, we got a little bit of time. So I'd like to go over this a little more in detail. As far as I know, and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the character that they say is Greek here is the letter Mame. There might be more, like the Zeta being like a Zaudi here for a Z. They might claim that as a Greek character, but there are Zions that predate that that also look exactly like a Z. Eric Bissell, the gentleman, our brother who does the Erictology videos from YouTube, he covers a lot of the different fonts and characters that are used in different places. There are some others that go over that as well. My, my contention here 
is that this is legitimate. And we can prove that because this is a, they say it was dated about a thousand BC. It would have been around the time of Dawid and Shalomo. The Greek language, they say, you can look it up on Wikipedia, was finalized or it's for, in its ancient form by the 9th, 8th century BC. So that's about 200 years after, 100, 200 years after the time that this would have been written, that they would have had these letters more formalized. But as Father Willing, you just got a little taste of it. And as we covered, you might have a conception in your mind by the time Dawid and Shalomo were reigning, they had an empire that spanned the world in collusion with them, with Hebrews all over the place. And there's something that we're going to cover more as we go through things, but this is some of the evidence for that. The fact that there were Hebrews in America that became Native Americans is a phenomenon that's known. It was written about in a few different books. One of them is called a view of the Hebrews. Another one is a star of the West. I'll try to share those in the description as well. The fact that they migrated to Japan was known all the way over 100 years ago in the 1920s and talked about in a speech by a gentleman who was in Japan for a long time and studied them. These things are might not be as prevalent anymore and the reasons for them we can talk about some other time. But my point is that you have evidence of Hebrews being spread east, west, north, south, and it's all over. So I'm not trying to discredit any of those things. We've also covered the fact that Buddhism was a foundation of a Hebrew, of someone from the northern, cap, uh, northern kingdom in captivity who was commemorating the fact that they did not have the sacred fire to make offerings with anymore. And the Budai, the Buddhists, if you will, are those that are exiled or separated. But um, in that information, I believe it's called the Saxons of the East and the West. It's the Lost Tribes, the Saxons of the East and the West is the title of the book there. I will share that as well. It covers the influences of the Hebrew in India, where the language was not using Hebrew characters at all. But when you take the the Sanskrit or the language that was written there and you transliterate it or you transcribe it literally, you just put the Hebrew characters instead of the ones that are there, then you can read it and it makes sense. And the gentleman went through all these inscriptions all over India where the beginnings of Buddhism was and found out it was all Hebrew that was just written in a different font. <clears throat> but he, can, he ties in the connection of the Northern Kingdom in its migration, it's Part of it being in India, the foundings of Buddhism, how Buddhism spread all the way to the British Isles and all the way to the Far East, and the evidence of the migrations of the people there still being of them. So it's really amazing. Um, my point is, here's another one, the letter Kof. Some of these letters, it might be more than that, they, they don't represent what people or scholars consider to be real Hebrew. That doesn't make it illegitimate. And... It's because of the information I just shared with you. You had Hebrews all over the world, literally, during the, the, the 1000 BC, during the reign of Shalomo. They were making three-year pilgrimages, circumnavigating the world, if you will, collecting things and doing trade, and then coming back. And you find Hebrew inscriptions all over North and South America. The, the words for things, especially in South America, Brazil is Brazil is iron, Peru is fruitful. You got a whole bunch of that stuff there. You have things in the Isles of Hawaii. There's even evidence of lands that we are not aware of in the world that have nations of people who speak a broken German that is Hebrew. There was a gentleman who got stranded in Europe in the 1800s that, that spoke a broken Germanic language that came from a kingdom of Saka from some place that no one had ever heard of that had a, a fantastic story. And he had been shipwrecked trying to find his brother. But we don't know about these things. And I, I can't really remember. It was in a an interesting video I'd seen from a man who was not a believer that was talking about that. And I didn't really get the connections of, of that at first. But much later, all these pieces started coming together, and I realized what that was. 
These are people, these are Hebrew ancestors that had been dispersed, that lost track of one another. After the fall of the United Kingdom, if you will, there was a loss of contact. They kind of broke off and became their own. The Indians became separate in North and South America, eventually even more division and spread into paganism. It, you can look into the histories and you can see that stuff for yourself. Um, Barry Fell, a gentleman who is decried as a, a hoax and someone who wasn't very um, good at being an amateur archaeologist, if you will, he discovered a lot of these writings, a lot of things in America. He wrote a few books, Saga America, Bronze Age America, and the like. There's others that have pointed these things out, but there's temples of Baal from the East Coast to the Grand Canyon. There might be even more in South America. But the paganism that was prevalent that came about afterwards was also carried over in different ways in different places. So... When you look at these and take it all in, not trying to make our own, like, not trying to prove things for ourselves, but just taking this information and seeing what is, the picture becomes clear that the things that you can see in history and in, in the scriptures literally happened. Where you don't have a direct reference in the Bible of these migrations, they're talked about like it's a thing that happened. Cadmus, Calcol, Dar, uh, Dardanus, they're mentioned in the times of Shalomo as Shalomo being wiser than them, but they preceded him by a little bit, right? You have the, um, the, sorry about that, you have the examples of the Greeks and the Danites working together mentioned in scripture but not elucidated in detail elsewhere you find those things in the secular writings is my point so real quick before we have to break off here i would like to go over this just so everyone can see the pictures aren't as clear on the rock as i would have liked them to be this is something that was done and i did go over it word for word i looked at every single thing i could i traced it and this is as accurate as I can determine. The only thing that is missing, and it covers it right here, you can see the normal spelling of the Hebrew has is without the hey character or my face, pene. You have pe, hey, noon, yod. That could be a spelling variant. That could have been the original way it was done. If you remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls has what the vowel pointing or the vowel system that they call mater lectonis or the mother of tongues and it is what preceded the the vowel points of the masoretic text in how vowels were used in hebrew at one point phoenician generally the inscriptions of the moabite stone and other places don't use that but in the writings of the dead sea scrolls it was used it's easier to write three letter root words that you can just read and get the context for on stone than it is making longer ones. I can see why that might have been done. And here is an example where you have that prevalent too. Lo is just Lamed Aleph without the Wa. And that's consistent, I believe, with the Phoenician of the time. Although later on they would have the Wa, and then the Wa would be replaced by a Holum, which is a dot after the Lamed there. But either way, if you'll permit, we'll just read this real quick. This is Anoki, or I am, it's like my plumb line, Yahua Elohika. And again, the, the wa here is not included. It's what you would call a defective spelling of the word. This is I am Yahua, your Elohim, Elohika. Asher, Hazu, is, is who has taken, and this is like to expel you or to export you, right? Atika, who has taken Aleph Tal, you, right? Me'aretz, from the land of Mitzrayim. And this part, just so you know, right here, and this Aleph are missing. They mention it right here. It says the, the right character Aleph is broken off, and the three characters of Maim, Zadi, and Resh are broken off there's a chunk of the stone where it's just gone. 
But right here it reads, I am Yahuwah your Elohim who brought you from the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage or slavery. This is Obedim, right? And then you have this little arrow pointing up here because this was inserted. It, it's supposed to go right here, but it actually inter breaks off between these two for whatever reason. And this is the first command. It says, Lo Yehi Elohim Achrim Al Pane. You says do not cause there to be Elohim others, right? New ones who came lately yoked to my face or my presence. And then you start with the next one. It says, no, or you shall not make the ose here, like ma asa from the book of Acts with a tau or a tav in front of it, which makes it past tense. Never make for yourself an idol, right? Pemal. This is never take that's the um nasa if you will to lift up bear and carry but with the past tense with the tau in front of it so never lift up aleph tau eth the shem of yahuwah la shav or la shua right unto vanity not falsehood fabrication or ruin this is zakor eth yam right so remember Zakar, like Zachary, right? Zakar Aleph Tal's Yom Ha Shabbat, the Sabbath, La Kadoshu, to keep him set apart. This is Kabod at, um, this is honor, right? Like Kavod or Kabod, Aleph Tal, Abika, your father, Wa Eth Amka, your mother. And this is so that, right? Arachnu, this is Arachon, sorry, like to be long or continue for a long time, so that long Yamin or Yamika, right, your days upon the ground, Ha'adama, right, that Yahuwah Elohika, your Elohim, Yatan, like Nathan with a Yod instead of the noon there, which he has given Lek unto you. And this right here is another thing that I find to be convincing. People might say that this is a Christian interpolation because it's mentioning a part of the commandment that you can't find in Exodus. But it's mentioned in the epistles by Shaul. And if you take him at his word, he was quoting verbatim. You can see that this is exactly the same thing that he quoted and said and that's the first command with promise. And I find it interesting that of all the commands, you can see they're abbreviated. But this one gets the detail of honor your father and your mother so that will be long your days upon the ground that Yahuwah your Elohim has given to you. That's the command with promise that's enumerated, right? I, I don't honestly know if this is the fuller version is in the Samaritan Pentateuch, if it was found in the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I'd have to look into that. But the next one is low, right? You never commit adultery. Oh, I'm sorry, right here. It says you never murder. You never commit adultery. Tau noon aleph pay, right? You never steal. And right here, this is a gimel. If you turn that around the other way and you kind of straighten that out, that's the gamma from the Greek. So these are very similar in character to what would have been in a few hundred years the Greek language that would have been adopted by it, right? The more you look back at that, the ancient, and it's covered in that book in detail, but you can also find the fonts. The ancient Greek is identical to the Phoenician. It was just written the other way, right to left. <clears throat> As time went on, those characters changed more and more to the modern Greek language that we have today. This is no, you must steal, right? Never or no, give testimony, right? In or against your neighbor, a witness that is false. So you don't give false testimony to your neighbor. And this word right here, shakar, that's where we get a, a word for sucker in English as far as I'm a word. If you're a sucker, it's about because you've got hoodwinked, right? It was false information that you believed. 
All right, and this is lo, never you desire tal chayth maim dalit. I'd have to look into that word. But it says, never you desire the wife, a shot of your neighbor, and all a share unto your neighbor. So it, you don't desire your the wife of your neighbor or anything that belongs to your neighbor, right? Encapsulating that 10th commandment there. If anyone wants to be studious, we've actually covered the full version of what you can read as far as we're aware that was originally in the Book of the Covenant. You can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, when you compare these versions. But the interaction between our Mashiach, who is on the top of the mountain speaking, giving the commandments and then interacting with them, and they said, oh, we don't want to hear his voice, lest we die. Um, all of that is missing from the Masoretic text. But right here you can see that it encompasses what we call the Decalogue, of course. It's not its fullness, but it is the gist of it. And I think that that gives it credence to its prevalence, especially because of the things mentioned. However, I leave it up for everyone else to look at and decide. I highly encourage you all to look at this information, to see these things, and perhaps then you'll see this in a different light and take it a little more seriously, where his word was written in stone for our generations for so long ago. If anyone's been paying attention, there's more things that are going to be made known as time goes on, especially with some of the discoveries that were made by Ron Wyatt. A lot of that has been revealed, and some of it will be in a time to come. I really look forward to those times, and I hope uh, I hope you're all there with me. Until then, you have a wonderful Shabbat, a great Shavuot Tov ahead, a great week, and we'll see you next time, all right? Shalom.